So by default, you have to accumulate debt. And here we are. I mean, we're, we're many, many decades in the U.S. and elsewhere around the world. We're many decades into this fiat money experiment. Uh, we've accumulated debt at all levels. And how do, how do governments now handle, especially in a pandemic, uh, you know, the, the situation, they, they print more money. Well, you know, that's adding ga gasoline to the fire. It's not going to end well in terms of, you know, the value of the dollar, the value of people's money. Welcome to this RTD interview. Today, I'm excited to have a returning guest, Dr. Quentin Henney, uh, the director of Newfound Gold Corp. And today, he's joining us to share his thoughts on the economy, precious metal sector, as well as some updates uh, with Newfound Gold Corp. And so, Dr. Henney, welcome back to RTD interviews. Thank you, Mike. Good to be here. Well, I appreciate you taking time to join me on such short notice. And as always, excited to you know, connect with you again. And our last interview was well received by the audience. So looking forward to uh, getting your analysis and thoughts on where we're at, as well as finding out uh, developments up in the Canadian region. So uh, before we dive into all that, of course, uh, the last time we spoke, uh, we were in a, in, a, in a different environment, but yet this new year, it's, uh, it's becoming even more interesting, to say the least, new administration, more stimulus, things like that. And so I'm curious to get your thoughts, you know, based upon the beginning of 2021, where we're heading into this, this year further. And it looks like we're working on our soon to be possibly third stimulus package, you know, freshly off a second one, which was passed in December. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just curious to get your thoughts on, you know, how many more should we expect? Where is this heading? Just, just give me yeah. your thoughts as to this whole stimulus world we're in. Yeah, it's funny. I got a few friends who uh, we're all gold bugs and we, you know, we all think alike and you kind of have the same, speak from the same book, so to speak. But uh, we have a, a saying whenever we see yet another stimulus and it's in accordance with the prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> So it kind of gives you a, a picture of where my head's at. Look, uh, this is uh, basically the culmination, if you will, of a fiat money system. When you you create funny money and, uh, you know, you accumulate debt, which is really a natural byproduct of, of printing funny money, because when you print money, you don't print the interest to go with it, okay? Right. So by default, you have to accumulate debt. And here we are. I mean, we're we're – many, many decades in the U S and elsewhere around the world were many decades into this fiat money experiment. Uh, we've accumulated debt at all levels and how do, how do governments now handle, especially in a pandemic, uh, you know, the, the situation, they, they print more money. Well, you know, that's adding ga gasoline to the fire. It's not going to end well in terms of, you know, the value of the dollar the value of people's money. Um, you know, while people I'm sure are very happy to see, you know, a $2,000 or $600 or $2,000 check or whatever come their way, here's the problem. Uh, a Big Mac is soon going to cost $20, okay? There's a downside to this. And uh, when people start to see that, it's not going to be cool. Right. And I agree. And so it's, it's, it's so what we're talking about is primarily focused on here in the United States of America, but yet, you know, it's happening everywhere. And so globally, you know, every government is responding in the same form and fashion with central banks kind of, I guess, being positioned as the saviors and it's never worked in prior history. So we'll, we'll see how that turns out. But along the way, um, I think we're going to witness all types of new experiments with the merger of monetary and fiscal policy. And so as a part of this new administration, uh, we have Janet Yellen, the former Fed chair one man, now also leading the treasury in a sense. So g give me your, your, your thoughts as to what type of things or tools or new types of policies that might roll out as, as a way to try to put, to put the water out on the, on the fire, but actually throwing more gas on it. Yeah. You know, when I was, uh, when I was younger and uh, tires cost a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you go and get them retreaded uh, because you want to, you want to make it la them last a little longer. That's about where we're at. I mean, look at the people. We're, we're dealing with the same old crowd, same old thesis. You know what? People who are the age of our politicians and, and Janet Yellen and so forth, they're not going to change feathers, okay? You know what's coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, look, in my view, it's pretty much more the same. This is the only solution they have is to print more money. And, you know, it really does uh, mean that gold, which um, – 
you know, by de facto, I guess, is a, a, a measure. You know, I mean, that's the way gold should be thought as a measure mm-hmm. of the purchasing power of, of currencies, especially the dollar. Yeah. It just, it means the gold's going to go up. There's no question. Right. I'd, I'd agree. And one of the, I guess, sad things about it. So majority, majority of, or all the viewers to, to this channel here are precious metals enthusiasts. So everyone understand the importance of having physical metal as well as exposure to mining, exploring operation, uh, exploring opportunities, but yet uh, the majority of the world does not. And so that's one of the, the sad factors is that people will think that the paper will be the answer to their problems when actually it's the problem itself. So it's going to be interesting and that's going to create more of a, a divide. And so as a part of their, their, their toolkits, they're trying to solve poverty and solve world inequality and all these social aspects that they're trying to solve with paper and it's not working, but given the fact we're also experiencing all time new highs and all the major indices around the world, as a result of all this, it's going to further that divide. Now, you know, that's clearly not sustainable, at some point this year or next year, do you see an awakening where people realize the, the true problems we're experiencing outside of, you know, their own personal issues? Yeah, look, I think uh, there's a lot of people, you know, the macroeconomic side that, you know, have a very good grasp of this. And, and some people, you know, like even Janet Yellen, I mean, look, she knows that where this is going to head. There's no way out of this mousetrap, right? So, you know, you have that crowd. But here's, here's the crowd I, I'm looking to or thinking of. Look, um, there's a lot of people in, the, in this country and others who are going to be deeply impacted by this behavior, this, uh, this pattern of printing money. Those are the ones I get concerned about. Like I said a minute ago, you know, everything's fine until your Big Mac costs $20. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, we've actually seen an increase in savings uh, in this country and, and some of the others during the pandemic here. You know, people don't have the ability to spend a lot of their money as easily as they did. And, and they've accumulated savings, but you know what, boy, the last thing you're going to want is to have money in the bank. I mean, I hate to say, but it sounds counterintuitive, but uh, if you have money in the bank, it's going to, that value is going to erode by the actions that are being taken right now. And that's going to have a a very negative impact. To answer your question, here's when, when, you know, basically the, you know, who hits the fan, so to speak, is when people do wake up and they realize that there is significant inflation. Okay. When, when they go to the store and they think, my gosh, I bought that two weeks ago and now it's a dollar higher, or I bought that big Mac, you know, uh, a year ago and it was five 95. Now it's eight 95 or whatever, you know, like when people start to see that rapid escalation of prices in, and they can literally see their bank account drain, but also realize that their purchasing power, that the uh, ability they have to buy what they need is diminished. That's when things get very, very bad for folks. Yeah, I agree. Now you you mentioned the banks and I want to touch on that because as a, as a, as a part of all the, 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 the mortgages not being paid, credit cards not being paid, all the debts that's being pushed off into the future, at some point it's going to fall on the banks and therefore the depositors funds and things of that nature. Now, do, do you foresee them, you know, some type of banking event coming because there's different, you know, different people, depending on who you, who you listen to in a, in a financial space, talking about a correction coming or something of that magnitude because they can't continue yeah. to kick the can down the road. Sure. We've never had a we've never, we've never had a, a complete banking experience here, similar to the way it was back in the Great Depression area. But you got people saying we're also in a Great Depression, a new Great Depression as well. So, yeah. you know, how, how much longer can they kick the can down the road, in your opinion? Look, to answer your question, we all know that there's going to be another event. Exactly yeah. what that event is, we don't have cl- clear sight on right now. It's kind of yeah. like back in 2006 and seven; you could see something was coming, but we didn't know exactly how it would, would unfold. Right. Okay, the same is true here, but insolvency is going to be a big issue. I, I would say that's like the basic ingredient, you know, in our in our current stew, our pot of of uh, trouble that's brewing here. Mm-hmm. Uh, insolvency is going to be kind of the, the base, you know, the broth, if you will. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could add to that now the other issues that we have and in almost all of them relate to debt. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, mortgage debt, but also student loan debt, you know, here's your carrots and t- potatoes and, you know, we're building this stew. Um, all of those are going to add up. Which one breaks the 
you know, camel's back first. I don't know. I, I don't pretend to know, mm -hmm. but I can tell you it's coming. Yeah. And, you know, look, um, this is one reason you don't want to have money in a bank account. Okay. Um, look at uh, Cyprus or look at Greece a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Guess what? You have money in a bank account. Is that money really yours? Mm. Right. No, it's not. <laughs> right. People right. Right. found out the hard way. Yeah. Yeah. Now, as a result of all this activity, they've been, they've managed, they meaning the, you know, the, the, the Comex and the LBMA and all those entities out there, they've managed to keep the price or somehow, some way, the, the price of gold and silver hasn't, haven't responded in the way that would be typical for the, the, the events that's unfolding. <laughs> and so at some point it has to break, but yet are they also capable of making sure that those prices never really truly reflect the amount of currency they're creating right now? <laughs> yeah, look, I, I don't profess to be, you know, a, a conspiracy theorist around gold price manipulation and stuff, mm -hmm. but here's what I look at, okay? I've been doing this stuff since I was young. I mean, I loved gold when I was young. So mm -hmm. I remember, you know, coming home when I was a kid, listening to Paul Harvey so I could catch the gold price, which is usually um, announced right around the time Paul Harvey had his little spiel. Okay. So if you look at the period from the late 1970s, gold went up, it went asymptotic, and it peaked in January 1980. Then it came off. <clears throat> but it formed what is really, in my view, the world's absolute largest cup pattern, okay? It went into a giant cup for about 30 years, and it peaked again in September of 2011, okay? So that's the other side of the cup. Mm -hmm. Everybody's whinging and moaning about gold over the past uh, nine years or so, you know, that it, it kind of peaked and came off. But it didn't really collapse, okay? You know, it, it kind of found a nice comfort zone in around 1,200 for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then we're seeing it. We saw it go up. It's, in my view, forming a nine-year handle. And we're in this very, very sensitive position right now where, yes, it, it feels, uh, you know, boring. Like you can hear a pin drop in the gold space. But, look, this thing is either going to break up to the upside in a big, big, big way, or it could break down. Now, what's your bet? <laughs> yeah, I would bet on it breaking up. And so along with, you know, silver as well. And so a lot of people are, you know, on the channel here are very happy about silver because it's something they can afford in, in bulk in comparison to not many people, you know, feeling comfortable going out and trying to, you know, get them one, uh, one ounce of gold. But uh, let's talk about that now. So also, I think when we, when we spoke last time, you, you really highlighted the importance of exposure to the physical as well as to uh, the, the mining sector and exploration opposite side of things as well. So Newfound Gold Corp up in the Canadian region, um, feel free to share with us a little bit of insights as to that because we're still, I'm still trying to educate the audience here. Sure. And so for all the new viewers, give us a little bit of background as to the operations there. And of course, we'll get to the, the, the good news as well. So give us a little bit of foundation for us. Okay, certainly. Look, first of all, about investing in gold. It's not an investment. Gold is not an investment. What it is, it's an insurance policy right, right. to make sure that you, you retain some of your wealth. If everything goes to heck in the handbasket, if you have 10% of your, your wealth tied up in gold, it, you at least have comfort around that. Okay. Right. And that's, that's why gold exists. Right. Now, as far as newfound goes, look, uh, in the gold space, discoveries are becoming much, much harder over time. Okay. As we, as geologists go out and we explore the planet, we picked over, in many areas, we picked over the low-hanging fruit. You know, the deposits that come to surface are easy to find. Okay, but as, a, occasionally, occasionally, and very rarely, we find an exceptional near-surface high-grade deposit. And this is one of those cases. Look, Newfoundland, a beautiful country. It, and if you go back about 12,000 years ago, it was covered by ice. Okay, mm -hmm. and glaciers make what we call till which is just kind of a gravel horizon that covers um, the surface and it's left behind by the glaciers. We could not see, like, because of the till, you can't see really what's going on there. You have to dig down through it and trench and find, you know, find an outcrop if you're lucky. Well, at Newfound Gold, uh, we happened to find a, an extremely rich gold deposit immediately underneath the till. 
it's right, basically right at surface. So what's happened over the past few months since we spoke last? We have announced at least a half a dozen, probably eight news releases, I think, something like this since September of just one high-grade hit after another. It is truly a remarkable discovery. Uh, we are seeing visible gold in many, many of the drill holes that we're drilling. And it's not just on one target. You know, at the Keat Zone, which is the main target for us uh, so far, we've demonstrated, I believe, up to around 111 meters strike on this system right now, this extremely high-grade system. And we have lots of holes that are in the lab that will come back soon, and we'll have lots more news. But we've also, get this, we've also drilled holes uh, two kilometers and a bit north on new targets. Mm -hmm. And guess what? They're seeing the same thing. When I see that, when any geologist sees that, you know you're in a big system, okay? You know, geologists are, I like to think we're the smartest people on the planet, but <laughs> it requires a certain degree of luck, okay? And given the till, the cover that we have here, you know, to hit hole after hole after hole like this, especially in new targets, is just a dream. It speaks to the geology that's underneath that till. It says there is a big gold system here. Mm. Now, you've been in, in the, the exploration and mining space for quite some time now, involved with a lot of projects. So it just sounds like this is this one of the most uh, possibly richest finds in, in, in your career, or, or where does this rank at? Well, I was very lucky to, to be part of the Fossilville story a few years ago. This is back in 2016. Mm -hmm. I helped, uh, I was advising uh, Eric Sprott on that. Mm -hmm. uh, he took a large stake in Newmarket, which owned the, the mine at that time. Mm -hmm. And that evolved uh, into one of the highest grade discoveries in, in modern history. The, mm -hmm. the Swan Zone, or what became the Swan Zone, turned into several million ounces at you know two to three ounce per ton kind of grades. Mm -hmm. And Kirkland Lake has done very well. So I was very lucky to be part of that. But, but more importantly, like, I can take that geology, everything I learned there and apply it to Newfound because the geology is almost identical. Hmm. It's the same kind of system and it's absolutely delightful to work on basically uh, one system and then see it mimicked elsewhere, you know, almost on the opposite side of the planet. Hmm. Um, again, it's the same kind of geology, same type of system, same high grain. And in my view, we have, because you know, you're seeing the thing at grassroots instead of, you know, way down in the ground, we basically have a lot more runway to work with at, uh, at Newfound. I think this will turn into a, a multi-million ounce, very high grade discovery. Interesting. Now, also for those that might just be, of course, as I mentioned, uh, coming across this info opportunity for the first time, share with us a little bit of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the investor base as to who's involved in the project. You know, you have skin in the game as well and give us some details so people can get a big, bigger picture of, you know, how the, the team functions. Okay, once the company came out of the gate, went public, Back in August, okay, the shareholder base, I'm going to ramble numbers up. I hope I got them right. Um, look, Palisade, which is the largest shareholder, has a roughly 32%. But Eric Sprott also has a very large holding. I believe it's something over 20%, maybe even 24%. Mm -hmm. Okay, so right there you have like 55 or 6% combined. Okay, but now Novo, the company that I'm chairman of, we hold a 15 million shares, which is just over 10% right now. So now you're up to 65% control. And then Rob McEwen, uh, you know, with McEwen Mining, but also Gold Corp Frame, uh, he owns, I believe, 7 or 8%. You know, so you're basically talking about 72-ish uh, percent, or 3, 73%, somewhere around there, mm -hmm. tied up in four entities. Okay, so the free float on this thing is very low. Uh, you know, there's other big shareholders, you know, I – I don't think they want to be talked about, but you know, there's other people that have uh, large blocks, obviously. So I would say in all reality, 90% uh, of the shares are in say a, a number of investors, uh, less than say a dozen. Mm, it's remarkable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, that's a lot right there. And so also, so you guys are publicly listed on Toronto stock exchange, but also there's some opportunities in here in the, in the U S share with us some insights as to what's going on there as well. Well, it goes back to what you were saying a little bit earlier is that, you know, not too many people, I guess, know about gold or know anything about investing in gold. But, uh, but I think what we see, what I, what I see personally, too, I think that this is like the late 1970s where be people became educated very quickly mm -hmm. uh, on, on as, as they saw the value of money decrease. 
they learned about gold, gold mining, gold investing very quickly. And it led to what ended up being the most wonderful boom in, in the gold space, uh, you know, in history. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's going to actually replicate, if not be better this time around. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at the American market. That's where the money is. Okay. We want exposure to the American market and we're looking at avenues to, uh, to achieve that. I think any company listed in Canada, if you want true exposure, you've got to get a, a concurrent, um, uh, U S listing in some way, shape or form, whether it's the OTC or even a big board. Right. Right. All right. Sounds good. So I appreciate you for sharing that. And so I, I take it by the time I release this video here, um, it, it'll be probably listed on the New York stock exchange or so that will be the actual way that uh, people can find out more. So for those that uh, want to explore more, how can they find out information uh, and stay up to date on developments and whatnot? Where would you want to direct them to? Yeah. Look, uh, newfound golds website, newfoundgold.com that's uh, the place to go uh we have also a wonderful ir team i believe all their contacts are posted on the website okay sounds good so once again i appreciate you for uh joining me once again in this new year and sharing some insights as to what's going on up in that region and so definitely looking forward to staying and you know involved and in, and in contact with you and definitely have you on down the line and we'll see where we're at and see how things are developing uh with newfound so once again dr henny thank you for joining us here on r3 interviews Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it.